Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the first 2024 BC Community Gaming Grant webinar. Um, I'm Kalina Kwan, Executive Director of BC Association for Charitable Gaming, that's BCACG. Um, so uh, BCACG helps nonprofits in BC access the BC Community Gaming Grant and the BC Gaming Capital Project Grant. If you need help with your gaming grant applications or have questions about the gaming grant guidelines um, and any questions on the gaming grants, um, you can get in touch with us or the gaming branch. Um, BCACG hosts monthly webinars as well as online drop-in Q&A sessions. So you can visit our website, bcacg.com, to see upcoming events. So today, um, I'm very happy to introduce our presenter, Amy Bond. Amy is the acting interim outreach and policy manager of the BC Community Gaming uh, Branch. Um, actually, we have um, quite a lot of people here today. We have over 100 people. Um, so I will hand things over to Amy. Thank you, Amy. Hi, thanks, Kalina. It's great to be here. Um, thank you for setting this up and thank you to everyone for attending today. All right, so start my presentation here. I'll just go over. Um, sort of the itinerary here. First, we'll talk about things that are new in the 2024 program guidelines. Uh, we'll do a little quick overview of the Community Gaming Grants Program, um, sort of a quick description of our, our two different funding streams and what the program is about. Uh, then we'll get right into it and we'll talk about which organizations uh, meet the criteria for grant funding, what kind of programs are supported by the grant, and a couple of our financial policies, so a bit more criteria. Um, then I'll go over how to apply for the grant, um, and then spending the grant. So if you are successful in getting funding, there's some rules around what type of expenses can be covered by it, and up to reporting out on it. We'll do a quick overview of the capital project grant stream, which is a, a slightly separate intake, as we'll get into, and then just offer you some resources at the end there um, so that you can get in touch with us or, or reach out to other organizations for assistance. Um, before we get started, I do want to acknowledge that today I'm coming to you from the lands of the Lekwungen people. We're known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees Nations. Uh, I do want to make a point to note that this is unceded land. Um, I thank them for their stewardship of this land, for which I'm grateful for the opportunity to live and work, connect with my community, and to participate in acts of ongoing reconciliation. Um, if anyone else would like to share what land they're on, uh, feel free to drop that into the chat there. I know we're coming from unceded lands all over BC. Okay, so what is new in the 2024 program guidelines? We've got a couple of key changes and as usual, some little minor updates and clarifications. So new for this year is organizations that are requesting $10,000 or less in funding will have the option to provide a simplified program financials for each of the programs they request funding for. Um, so what this looks like is rather than the, the full set of the program actual revenues and expenses with line by line description of every revenue source and every expense, um, you'll just be including total program revenue, the total program expenses, and then the sources and amounts of any other government funding that comes from provincial and federal sources. Um, In-kind is welcome, but as always, that's optional if you have in-kind contributions to include, um, and budgets will not be required. So this is if the total grant application for all the programs adds up to 10,000 or less, you can use these simplified program actuals. If you're requesting a higher amount than that, then nothing has changed. 
Uh, we've also added information in Section 5.5 for Indigenous not-for-profit organizations that are considering applying for a community gaming grant. So this section provides some additional information about policy considerations that may be made and um, information for organizations to contact the branch if they want to discuss their applications or have questions prior to applying. Other key changes. Um, so the definition for the sport sector and sport programming has been clarified. Um, what we've really done here is just to focus in the definition for the programs that they provide instruction and a pathway to development with opportunities to compete, um, just focusing more on that instruction and pathway. Um, it's not all about um, successful competition. Uh, programs that primarily deliver specialized training to elite athletes or only provide travel opportunities are not eligible. Uh, we've also added a definition of what an elite athlete is. That part has always been in there, um, but we, we thought we ought to uh, define what is meant by that. And, and with the travel opportunities, uh, travel as always is, continues to be an eligible cost especially if you are traveling for competition um, that's merit-based. Um, travel, just travel in itself is not being seen as an eligible program. So there has to be some other development, some other coaching, some other activity there behind it. Um, then we've also combined the two sections, I believe it was 6.4 and 6.5 for minor capital projects and capital acquisitions. We've combined these sections into one to simplify. There was a lot of repetition there. Um, so we've clarified in that, that any individual item, any acquisition that's over $5,000 requires a quote. And then any projects that you're doing, if it requires the work of a contractor, that is also what requires a quote. So not a big change in the policy there, just trying to clarify it and simplify um, and, and to not repeat sort of the same things. So a little overview about who we are and what we do at Community Gaming Grants. Um, so the program is funded with commercial gaming revenue. Um, so this has been around for a number of years, um, going back to 2010 for this specific program and prior to that in other iterations of it. Um, so what the programming is about is it's really meant to support community-driven programs. So what the people in each community see, what programs and services they want, how they define benefit to their community. Uh, it comes in two basic funding streams and our flagship, I call it our flagship program, the Community Gaming Program Grants, help not-for-profits deliver ongoing programs. So these are programs and services, things that are happening in the community. Um, that one has most of our budget, 135 million is directed toward that. Uh, it's not a competitive grant process at all. So all eligible applications will receive funding at some level. About 90% of all applicants receive a grant. Uh, the average grant amount was $29,000 in the 22-23 grant year. And there is approximately 50,000 organizations all across BC that are getting funded. If you're curious about how that breakdown is, we do have an annual report also available on our website. So if you, if you like data, um, that's a good place to go look. Uh, the other intake that we have is our capital project grants program. That one has a much smaller budget, $5 million is dedicated for capital projects. And this helps not-for-profits to complete capital projects or purchase large-scale acquisitions um, that benefit their community. So this one is a competitive grant pro process. We regularly get um, many more applications than what we have the budget to fund. Um, grants are up to $250,000, and we can provide the matching funds between 20 and 50% of the total project cost. 
it does have a separate program guide and we will do another webinar later in the year, usually closer to June when that intake opens to go over all the details of that. Um, and that one, we are still looking at the policy for 2024, so there hasn't been any announcements yet. So within the Community Gaming Program grants, we fund in six unique sectors, and we do this throughout the year. Um, they're rolling intakes, I've got them here in the order that they come in. Um, there's so many different kinds of programming across the province. We've broken it out like this to help us um, track our funding to the different sectors for our reporting out. As I mentioned in the annual report, also helps us manage the intake so that we know we're, we're getting these in applications coming in throughout the year and funding them out throughout the year um, with over 5,000 applications. We may not be able to do that if they all came in at once. Um, so I'll run through each of the sectors and give you a sense of what each of them is about. Arts and culture is the, the first sector to open. It's open now, February 1st to April 30th. Um, those organizations will get their notification by the end of August. So these are programs that provide public access to and or preservation of arts, heritage, or culture. Uh, we really put a focus on that. It's about public access and community participation in the arts, arts and culture. It's not always just the best artists get an award, but how many people in the community are actually interested in these programs and, and participating. Uh, the next is sport. So these are community-based amateur programs for organized, competitive physical activity, includes instruction, provides a pathway to development, and there's opportunities to compete. The intake opens March 1st, closes May 31st, and those applicants will receive notification by the end of September. Now, moving on into our summer intakes, we have the environment and the public safety are both open at the same time, July 1st to August 31st and they'll receive their notification at the end of November. Programs in the environment sector revitalize, protect, or provide education on ecosystems and the environment. Uh, we see a range of things from public education programs. Um, we see programs where there's boots on the ground, people out pulling invasive species, monitoring streams, rehabilitating waterways, for salmon and other species at risk. Uh, public safety funding goes to programs that enhance and support community public safety initiatives. So this includes things like your search and rescue on land, water. Uh, I think there's even some helicopter rescues and highway, volunteer firefighters. There's also community justice programs. Um, and anti-racism initiatives will fall into this. Um, and then we have our human and social services sector, which is by far the largest sector with the most subsectors within it. Um, generally speaking, the sector has programs that significantly contribute to the quality of life in a community. Um, so this could be a range of different things. Um, we have child care organizations, senior centers. Um, the support of housing, uh, community education, literacy centers. It's really, it's all over. Um, it also includes service clubs who can apply for a community donations program, uh, service clubs are groups that can support their communities with their community gaming grants and make micro grants back into the community, knowing what's most needed there. Uh, this sector is open August 1st until November 30th, and we do our very best to get notification out by the end of February. And last but not least, I cannot forget the parent advisory councils and the district parent advisory councils. So funding is provided to the PACs and the DPACs. Um, so each school PAC 
can receive $20 per student uh, with a minimum grant of $2,000 and the district tax get a flat $2,500 grant. Um, and those go to support extracurricular activities for students in grades um, kindergarten to grade 12. And the DPAC grants are there to foster parental involvement in communications with the school system. But those intakes are open April 1st until June 30th and notification and the funding come out by the end of September to enable those monies to be available for most of the school year. So funding levels, a lot of people ask about funding levels. How do we decide how much to fund? Um, what's the maximum? How much should we ask for? So the level of funding awarded is based on the size and scope and the community benefit of the programming that's been applied for um, as it's presented in the application. So the maximum level that we can give out for a local organization is $125,000 in total funding per year. Uh, for a regional or provincial organizations that have a larger scope, um, they may be operating in multiple communities, they may be an umbrella organization supporting other, other groups in their sector, the maximum is $250,000. Um, I always get a lot of questions about this. Um, other factors include the overall demand that we receive and the available funding. If you have questions about if you're a local or a regional organization, uh, you can include sort of a justification or a business case in your application. It would be showing that you're either a lead in your sector and other, other organizations that are smaller look to you for leadership or coordination and or you're providing programming in multiple communities over a large geographic area, or perhaps there's few or no other comparable service providers in your jurisdiction. Um, so it can be a variety of things. It'll be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. We'll go into some of our criteria now and what types of organizations are eligible for the grant um, to be eligible. An organization must be a not-for-profit. You don't have to be provincially or federally registered officially, um, but you do need to, to meet the rest of this structure. So you must have a purpose that supports community benefit, um, not only supporting just the members. Uh, deliver programs and services within your community. You should have an open membership. So anyone in your community who's interested in furthering your mandate is able to get involved and participate in that. Um, if there are restrictions on who can become a member, would ask that you provide a rationale for that. And it sh there should be a connection between the primary purpose of your organization and a membership restriction. Um, some examples is it may be allowable when there's a rationale like your purpose is to promote the interests and welfare of an identifiable group or class of people that are characterized by something covered under um, human rights legislation. Um, so if you're granting a preference to members in a group or class of people in good faith to ensure that their participation is there, that could be considered um, other instances are when you're a governing body or an umbrella organization for other groups and your your membership is made up of those organizations and they sort of have a, a democratic process from the ground up and they're they're voting in who their representative is. Um, so you may not be able to have tens of thousands of members, but you have a few from each of those membership organizations. Um, so that brings me into the, the democratic process. So eligible organizations should have a volunteer board of directors and a voting membership who elects them. We do need more than double the number of voting members to board members to show a democratic process. Um, that just being said, if you have 10 board members, 
that elect themselves every year and there's no other general members to vote them in, it's not really reflecting a democratic process. Um, and then those board members, at least two thirds of them should reside in BC and they should not receive remuneration for their role as a board member. An organization is ineligible if it is for profit organization or if it exists solely to support a for profit organization. Member funded societies are not eligible. And I'll just speak to this quickly because we get a lot of questions. This refers to the legal definition of member funded society as outlined in the BC Societies Act. Um, member funded societies you would have had to chosen to register that way and it'll be written right on your constitution. Uh, this means that you can pay out dividends to your membership and upon dissolution, those members can take shares of, of any of the assets that are left. So member funded under that definition are not eligible for most um, government grant programs. If you find that you've accidentally registered that way, you can contact BC registries and inquire about ways to, to change that status. Uh, we don't fund any political parties, any political action groups or lobby groups. We don't fund any other levels of government. So no federal, provincial, regional governments, municipal, First Nation or any other type of local government. Um, again, this is community-based programming. We're not here to support other government programs or anything that's required to be delivered by a government. So that extends into any kind of government facilities. So healthcare facilities, educational um, libraries, museums, if those are run by a level of government. So your, your city library, for example, um, wouldn't be eligible. Some of these, there are not-for-profit, there's not-for-profit museums, there's not-for-profit um, libraries, educational um, societies, and even not-for-profit healthcare. If it's not one of these government facilities, that, that's okay. It's government run or completely government funded. Uh, we don't fund professional and industry associations. Typically their programming is aimed at their members for professional development. Um, networking, that kind of thing. We're looking at funding things that are benefiting the entire community. And finally, religious institutions. Um, well, many religious institutions also operate as a not-for-profit in a sense um, that they're not generating profit and they operate for community benefit. Very often they're not eligible by default because they don't have that, that eligible structure of having an elected board of directors um, and the open membership. However, many not-for-profit organizations that are affiliated with a religious institution are eligible when they meet that other criteria. So it's not the tie to the religion that makes it not eligible, it's just the overall structure of how they're set up. Um, so I hope that answered questions about the organizations and I'll, I'll look forward to your questions at the end on that. We'll do a little overview on the types of programs that we are able to fund and those that we aren't. So community gaming grant supports a wide range of unique programs. With all those six sectors, there's so many different types that come in. Um, our applications are submitted on a program basis. So when you apply, you provide information about your organization and then for every program that you want to have funding for, you can provide information on that. Um, how we define program is fairly open. It's an ongoing service, activity, or series of activities. Our program delivery, so the programs have to be running at the time of application. We will look at new programs that haven't been run for a full year yet, but you have to have at least launched it. We don't provide uh, seed funding. For, for new initiatives and things that haven't been tested yet. Um, and then the programs have to be directly delivered by the applicant. So this is to avoid um, double funding 
by accident. So if you're in partnership, two or three or more organizations in partnership to, to do an initiative, choose which one is in direct delivery of the programming, who's responsible for most of the activities or who's taking care of most of the financials and choose one and have that one apply. Um, and then the programs, of course, have to demonstrate that there's some benefit happening to the broader community. You should be able to talk about how it's responsive to the community's needs. New programs, you can say, what gap are you filling? What unmet need are you trying to address? And then for these programs that have been around for a long time, does it change if, if needed, right? Um, we saw a huge shift in many programs during the pandemic because the needs in communities changed. So showing that responsiveness, um, demonstrating that the programs are accessible to people in the community and they're inclusive. So you're not unnecessarily restricting them. They can be certain programs may be aimed at a specific clientele, um, but again, that's okay. But again, showing that it's, it's open to those who need those services and that there's no unnecessary restrictions on who can access it. Um, and then to provide an immediate direct service. So part of Community Gaming Grants is an annual application. I'll get into the spending rules later, but basically we're hoping to have the money spent within the first year. So this is to get things done immediately. So we don't, for that reason, I'll get into the next slide here. On the ineligible programs, um, things that don't deliver an immediate direct service, things like research, um, things like committees that don't, it doesn't result in some kind of an action. Uh, so those kinds of programs won't be eligible. Uh, we also won't fund a program that's being delivered on contract or under a funding agreement. So if you're delivering it on behalf of someone else, very often this is like a government program and you've already been contracted by another ministry to deliver something, um, but it could be another contract as well. Um, there's a difference there between contracts and grants. So definitely do look at your agreements if you have other funding that's there. We're wanting to know the applicant is in direct control of the programming and they're making the decisions. Um, just having a facility or a venue open and available in itself is not considered an eligible program. We're interested in knowing what's happening inside that facility, what activities, what services are ongoing, and that's what we could fund. I'm providing financial assistance to individuals. This one is really difficult for us to be able to assess and provide funding for because the needs can change year to year. Um, there's also it can get into like providing micro grants to people, um, giving checks to individuals, things like that. It's just not something that we're able to support at this time, um, both due to the difficulty in assessing what the need may be year to year, and also just due to budgetary constraints. As we don't fund vocational training programs, um, there is Ministry of Advanced Education, offers many different programs down that range. Um, if you do have a volunteer training program and you need to train volunteers in order to deliver your own programs, that can be included as an eligible cost um, and as part of your, your program expenses. So that's okay, but not for vocational training for paid individuals and things like professional development for paid staff um, will not be something that we support, um, fundraising programs or social enterprise. So if you're raising money to do something, again, we're interested in what is that thing that you're trying to do. We'd rather fund the direct activity than just provide money for, for a fundraising drive. Um, also selling tangible goods and food to people. If you're providing some tangible concrete thing and charging money for it. Um, it's not something that we're able to support at this time. Um, the services, sure, but um, the food, food and tangible goods we're not able to support. 
um, or programs that primarily benefit other organizations. So typically we see this as um, very often like capacity building or you're only uh, an umbrella group that's serving its membership organizations and helping them with some admin or different things. So again, we're looking for these programs that directly benefit the end user. And you can see concrete um, deliverables in the community. How many people, many individuals in your community benefited? So a little bit of advice about how to describe the program. So for every program you apply for, you need to provide a program description. Uh, we do have a table in our guidelines that goes over this, who, what, when, where, how. I find it really useful. I always point people toward it. You do want to keep your program description brief, but really clear, right? So you have the people who are reading this. Think of your readers. They don't know what it is that you're doing. How are you? What's your elevator pitch? How are you going to get this across in the simplest, um, shortest way, though adding too much confusion? So who benefits, how many people, that helps us with the scope and helps us to know if it's aimed at a certain group of people or if it if it's any anybody can kind of drop in. Uh, what, what are the activities? Uh, you'll notice we don't have why on here because we, we never need to ask for that. Um, we see the why, we understand the why. Uh, we see how important a lot of these programs are and talking about why they're important is great, but what is the actual activity that's happening is something that we often need to ask for clarification on. Uh, when, so how often do programs run? Is this something that happens weekly, monthly, annually? Um, do you have a, a six week season where maybe you have activities two to three times a week for that period and then it's over. Again, it helps us understand the scope of the program. Uh, the where, so where is it delivered? Um, is this just in your community? Is it in multiple communities? Do you have to rent a facility? Is it a traveling program and, and you need um, a lot of mileage for it? So it helps us understand how it's being delivered. And then in the how, you can talk about how it's accessible, how is it inclusive, um, and also like how is it delivered, who's delivering it? Uh, do you have volunteers doing most of the work? Do you need to have paid staff because it's a specialized service? So things like that. Um, so I would really recommend that you don't have a program description that's more than two pages at maximum. Um, if you can get out all of that information within two pages, that's great. Uh, if it's a brand new program and it hasn't run for a full year yet, again, but it has launched, make it really clear that you have started to run the program when it, when it opened up. Um, and tell us what the reason is, what is that unmet need? What is that gap in service that you're trying to address? And what is your plan to keep this ongoing? to make sure it's not just a like a, a fixed point in time project. We're going to run this for six months and then end. So tell us how you plan to keep it going. So just going back to the comment earlier that this is a program based application. You can apply for multiple programs within a single application. Some organizations will only run one program while well, other organizations will have multiple. So this is an example of an organization that runs one program. Sunshine Theatre Society has their theater program. It is a season of productions. Um, so everything that they do is around running this season. Their rent of the theater, their wages for their staff, materials, advertising, that kind of thing, it's all around this this production season. Um, we're in a second example. Uh, Sunshine Arts Council has multiple programs that are all very distinct. So uh, an art gallery and display. Uh, 
is very different than their, their summer folk music festival, which is an annual event, which again is very different, aimed at a different audience. They also have youth art lessons and kids camps. Maybe it's spring break camps and summer break camps. Uh, these all have different audiences, diff maybe different facilities that they're operating out of, different staff. So it makes sense to break them up separately so that you can show sort of the size and the scope of all of these. So you'd apply for these all separate, each one with its own program description and each with its own program financials. Talk a little bit about our financial criteria here. Um, it comes in to place at two levels. Um, one is when the organization itself is assessed for eligibility. We look at the organization's most recent financial statements to look for financial need. And then we'll also look for each of those programs requested at the program financials um, to make sure that those are viable and also to make sure it's not overfunded already by other government sources. The first one I'll talk about the organization financial eligibility and the main criteria we have here is uh, our surplus policy. So this is saying an organization is temporarily ineligible to receive a grant if there's more than 50% of the previous year's expenses on hand in unrestricted funds. I've included the calculation here on the slide. This is also in our guidelines. So we will look at the balance sheet um, and take all of the current cash and investment amounts. We'll subtract gaming funds, any gaming funds that you have already, all of your current liabilities, subtract internally and externally restricted funds to find the amount that is available on hand. And then that gets divided by that same year's total operating expenses. And times 100 comes up with the surplus. Just show you an example, uh, financial statements to kind of show you where this is. So this first slide here is a, an example balance sheet. We're looking at the cash on hand, cash in the bank, investments. They're so taking that number, then we'll subtract. On this balance sheet, they have accounts payable. Uh, they also have down here under fund balances, externally restricted and internally restricted and there's references to notes. So that's really helpful to have. We're gonna to want to look at the notes to see um, sort of what the revenue source is for the externally restricted and the internally restricted as well. Um, it should be for a specific purpose, such as like a planning to make a large um, purchase or you have a capital project coming up, that kind of thing. And for the internally restricted, we'll also ask for minutes from the meeting at which the membership or the board has restricted those. So we know what the specific purpose is and the date they were restricted. Internally restricted funds will be honored for up to five years or up to seven if it's for a major capital project. Then on the revenue and expense side, we're just looking at this bottom line here, the total expenses. So once we know what the available funds are, it gets divided over that number there. And that's how we do that calculation. Uh, for the program financial criteria, so this is for every program you apply for, uh, the criteria here is that federal and provincial funding cannot exceed 75% of the total program cost. So again, I've got an example program uh, revenue and expense statement here to show you. We do ask for any of your, your revenue sources to be clearly identified. Don't use acronyms. That's so we can identify it here. Um, so federal XYZ department, provincial ABC ministry, they've identified their community gaming grant. We can add up those amounts here. Anything provincial or federal gets added up, and then we just divide it right over the total program expenses. So the other 25% or more um, has to come from community sources. 
So this would be revenue sources like user fees, fundraising, any municipal or regional government grants, um, private grants. Maybe you have some corporate donors that you're getting money from. Uh, the other part of this is you can also include in-kind contributions. So in this example here, they've got the in-kind contributions listed. And so what that does is it actually increases the total expenses. In this example, from 15,000 up to 28,000. So it makes that a larger number to be dividing by. We'll talk a little bit. Oh, I've, I'll go into that in a moment. First, I'm just going to go over this new um, simplified program financials, as we touched on in the beginning. If your organization is requesting 10,000 or less, you can do simplified program financials. I just showed you an example of a full set of program financials. So these simplified ones, we do have a template, an Excel document template available on our website now that you can use, or you can make up your, mo your own. It's not required to use ours. But we're really just looking for that total program revenue, the total program expense, and then identify what the government funding is. So include the source, like the name of it, um, and the amount that you get. You can also include in-kind contributions. That's optional, again, if you have other higher sources of government funding and you're wanting to offset that, it is recommended to show those in-kind contributions. It also demonstrates some community support. We're just trying to make things simpler for some of the, um, the smaller organizations that, that aren't requesting a lot of money. And maybe you have four or five different programs and you only request a couple hundred dollars for each. And I think providing something of this level of detail is just a little bit much for that. So we're trying to offer a simplified version of that. Now I'll, I'll get in, I've mentioned in-kind a few times and I'll just get into that. Um, so in-kind support is always optional. As I mentioned, it can help offset other, other government funding. It shows that you have community support. Um, this can include volunteer time, donated labor, um, equipment, professional services, materials. So we typically value like general volunteer labor at around $20 an hour. If it's a professional service, you can mark down what the fair market value is. Um, or if it's a professional service and they're giving you a discount, you can show that as well. So we ask if you do include it, that you show it as both a revenue and an expense. So the amounts cancel each other out. Um, it doesn't, your bottom line will still be the same. And you should support this with an in-kind contribution summary. And we have an example of that on our website. It's basically telling us how you came up with those numbers. So 10 volunteers came out and they each spent five hours doing setup for the event at $20 an hour. That equals out to X amount. Uh, you can also prorate your operating costs, like general organizational operating costs into your program financials. That also, you wanna make sure all those expenses are captured, um, but you should prorate it for how much it's actually related to that program. Um, so if you have an employee that spends 40% of their time working in a program, you'll include 40% of their wages as a program expense. Um, and this can go, you can, do some quick um, calculations and estimations for this, how much of your, your occupancy costs are related to this specific program, how much of your wages are for this, things like that. Uh, so here's an example for eligible program expenses. Going back to that example organization that had multiple programs, so you can see that they have um, their director, their, their executive director, spent equal amounts of times on all five activities. They prorated their wages across all three of those programs. 
And I've said they also spend time on their fundraising, so you're not including that. And then just governance, administration, that kind of thing. So that's not included in one of the application in one of the program requests. Uh, what when should you apply and what financials should you do? We always ask for the most recent, complete fiscal year. So depending on when your organization's fiscal year is and when your sector intake is, you should have a look at that. Um, so in this example, this organization has three months after its fiscal year end to prepare financials before applying. For some organizations that may be doable, I know for some other larger organizations, they won't be ready in three months. They may want to consider applying at a different time. So in this example, the organization has only one day after its fiscal year end to prepare financials before applying. This is going to be difficult for anyone, so they should definitely consider applying sooner. If they apply before their year end, uh, they can submit financials that are 11 months old, and that will be accepted. And then in this example, the organization has 11 months after its year end. So they could apply any time between February 1st and March 30th and use the prior year financials. Uh, we're used to seeing that, so it's, it's not a problem to send in those older ones. Um, if you find yourself in a tricky spot where it's, it's past your fiscal year end, but you don't have your financials back from your, your accountant because you do send them there, you can provide draft statements for that year. So whatever information you do have on hand, it doesn't have to be the uh, signed off at the AGM version or audited statements or anything like that. It can be just the internally prepared draft statements as well. So how do you go about applying for the grant? There's a whole how-to. First, I'll just provide some tips and advice. So definitely, especially if you're a first-time applicant, read the program guidelines and conditions. Uh, for those of you that apply every year, and this is all old news, we do include a section at the beginning of our guidelines now that says what's new, and it gives an overview of all the changes. So definitely have a look at that. And, and look up those sections for more details. Uh, we do have a pre-application checklist available on our website. Um, it's great to use. You can keep it there on the side of your desk and check things off as you get them prepared. We do have example documents for almost everything on our website. If we're asking for something and you're not sure what it is or how to prepare it, we have examples you can copy. Um, as well as with the program, the simplified program financials, there's an Excel template. For the regular ones, we have an example document in PDF, and the second page is a fillable form, so you can just adopt that if you want. Uh, if it's applicable, uh, it's always a good idea to have a professional review your financials, uh, just best practice. Say, save all of your required documents. Always make make a folder on your computer desktop that says like community gaming application and save everything in there for ease of access. You can upload Word documents, Excel, PDF, and JPEG into the online application. Um, if relevant, address items from your previous year. So definitely I always recommend organizations have a look at that notification letter when it comes right in and um, you know, start working right away if there's any any issues that are flagged to get those resolved. Um, if you haven't, and it was a busy time of year when you got it, pick it up, you know, more than a week before you need to apply. Pick it up at, at least a month or six weeks before you intend to apply and look at it and see, is there something that we were supposed to, to contact Community Gaming Grants about? Did they ask for follow-up or more information on something? Uh, make sure that your reporting is all up to date, your repeat applicant. And definitely you can contact myself or our, uh, our policy and outreach team if you need any assistance with difficult issues. 
uh, and I'll provide that contact information at the end here. And definitely apply early as possible. We process applications in the order that they're received, and we cannot guarantee funding for applications that are submitted late. In the past, we've done our best to support those um, wherever we could. However, uh, increasing pressures on the budget are making this more and more difficult every year. Um, so I definitely say do make sure you get it in on time. And, and definitely the sooner the better. So how to apply? So it's an online application. I'm showing you a screenshot here. This is from our website. And there is down the left hand side, it says online service. And you click that and you start to follow it. Just showing you some other screenshots because you can get lost. When you get to this page, you want to click the launch online service button, which will bring you here. You're not lost. Stay on that left side where it says apply online. These are all links for the different things you can apply under. So you choose the community gaming grants. See, there's a link there for the capital project grants. Um, special approvals and licensing, things like that are also there. So once you click on that link, it'll actually open up the application and ask you to enter your organization name or your file number if you're a repeat applicant. If you are not um, satisfied with the outcome of your application, um, you can also request a reconsideration of the decision. You must request this within 30 days of receiving your notification and state the reasons why you think the decision should be varied or overturned. So it's really important to look at that notification and call out the specific points that you disagree with. The purpose of a reconsideration is um, to see if there was any errors or omissions that were made in the assessment. It's not an opportunity to, to supply a bunch of brand new information that wasn't originally submitted or just to say, um, well, we just would like more money with no sort of reason behind it. Um, so if you think that there has been an error made or a misunderstanding on the part of the person who did the assessment, tell us what you think that, that misunderstanding or that error was and we'll take a second look at it. Um, a final decision will be sent back to you within 90 days. They will either um, uphold the original decision or they may vary the decision or they may approve your, fully approve your request and they'll tell you in your letter. Now, you've got the money. Now you wanna know how you can spend the grant. What can you do with it? So lots of eligible expenses, um, pretty much anything directly related to the program. Um, any of these direct program cost wages, including contractors, um, rent, utilities, insurance, all of those occupancy costs. You have program supplies, office supplies, internet and phone, advertising, all of that falls under eligible. If you need to rent or purchase specialized equipment, um, if you need to travel, if travel is an essential part of the programming uh, within BC, that's okay. If you are traveling out of province, um, back on that last page under special approvals, there's another, another form to fill out for that, telling us why you have to, to use the money to travel outside BC. Um, you can also use up to 15% of your total grant. You can retain that and just use it for general operational costs for your organization. So things that may not meet the list of eligible expenses, but are also not listed as an ineligible expense, things like general insurance or accounting fees, like paying to get your, your annual statements done things like that. Um, this was introduced a couple of years ago just to offer a bit more flexibility on how you can use your grant funds. And sometimes those, those sort of surprise expenses come up and it may not be directly related to the program delivery, but it is essential to be able to continue business. So there is a bit of flexibility when needed for that. 
Um, you can also request additional grant funds for and use them on minor capital projects or capital acquisitions. So capital projects, um, we do have the other capital project grant stream. So that is again for projects that are valued at 20,000 or more. So for that reason, we can only support capital projects with a total project value of under 20,000 on your regular community gaming program grant. So these are smaller projects. Um, these may be like accessibility improvements, installation, some minor construction. Maybe you need a wheelchair ramp or you need to replace a toilet. Maybe you're doing a small upgrade in your kitchen, um, things like that. So we do look for a quote um, if it's requiring the work of a contractor or if any specific item you're buying is more than $5,000. You do have to use the regular form application. You cannot request this additional funding on our, our renewed funding applications, which is an essentially just a, an extension of the previous year. And the minor capital project or the acquisition does have to be directly related to the programming that we've already approved funding for. So it's gotta be essential. Tell us how it's essential. Um, if you're running a daycare, and you need to redo the cubbies for the kids. Um, still take the moment and put in a sentence and tell us why that cubby is essential. So again, these are the two sections we've combined in the guidelines. So have a look at that section there now. Um, not much has changed. Uh, on the acquisitions could be like larger one-time purchases. So things that aren't like regular supplies um, and things that you'll go through quickly. It could be vehicle, computer, audio-visual equipment, um, furniture, appliances, things like that. And again, the same rules apply for if it's over $5,000 or it needs a contract or installation. Um, Timelines. We talked about timelines for when you should apply in relation to your year end. There's also spending timelines. So once the money is deposited, which will be within a day or two of when you get your notification letter, you can start spending the funds immediately. Uh, you must spend those grant funds within 12 months of receipt. If you cannot, you can contact us and ask for an extension. We'll ask you what the reason is, why you can't spend it, and how long do you think it's gonna take you to spend it? Um, you can also put these funds moving backward if it's within the same fiscal year. So you can back pay expenses that are incurred in the same year that you've received your grant. Uh, for simplicity's sake, if, you're, if your fiscal year end is December 31st and you get your grant funding sometime in September, you could back pay expenses all the way going back to January 1st of that year, and you could go forward for an additional 12 months. You can't pay past debt, which is considered a previous fiscal year, um, and you can't pay future costs that haven't incurred. So you can't prepay your rent for the next two years. But if you have an invoice in hand, payment is due, then that's fine to go ahead and pay. Uh, we will deposit your grant funds into a designated bank account that we ask you to open before applying. Um, so this is all eligible expenses should be paid directly from that account whenever possible. If you need to transfer funds to your general account or operating account to reimburse other program expenses, that's okay. Um, you can do that either by check or by EFT to your operating account. Um, checks should all be double signed by two board members. If you're doing an EFT um, to the other account, you should have a, a written statement prepared and signed by two board members saying, what is the total, what is the, the top amount that any one transfer can be? So a maximum amount and what are the purposes? So the board might create a policy and, and sign off on a letter saying transfers can be made out of the gaming account to cover 
wages and rent and the maximum transfer amount is five thousand dollars for example um, but that's for your board to to decide um, but they should have that documented once a year we'll ask you to report out on your use of grant funds uh, this is done based on every organization's own fiscal so it's not based on what grant you got or what your timing of when you received the grant but you'll do this at the end of your fiscal year within 90 days of the end of your fiscal year so you have that three month window when your year end happens and you're already doing all of your year end finances that's the time that you should do your gaming account summary report uh, you won't get a reminder from us at this time we don't have the capability to do that um, and really it's just tracking the activity within that bank account during the course of the last period that last fiscal year uh, there is also a section that says please describe how the community benefited you can just put in a few sentences or a short short paragraph um, some statistics in there are sometimes helpful we use this for our reporting out too to tell other other areas of government what the impact of our program is so this is just an example of what it looks like I wanted to point out it's not as scary as it looks I know it looks a bit like a tax form there's a lot on here that's probably not applicable um, so there is information like your file number that you'll have that'll be on your notification letter date that you re you completed it the period that it's for this is just your organization information address city opening balance here should always be equal to the closing balance of the previous year because we're tracking what happened in that account year to year if you're a first time grant recipient that'll be zero then there's a spot for you to record how much grant funding you got with just different lines because you can write it for community gaming grant pack grant capital project um, if you are doing licensed gaming there's sections down here for that and this whole section four is all around your raffles and your licensed gaming so if you're not doing that you don't even need to worry about those um, there is spots here if you have other revenue coming in if you have interest being earned on the account uh, if you sold a large asset that was purchased with gaming funds they would give you a capital project grant in 2020 and for fifty thousand dollars to buy a new vehicle and you decide oh it's not right we're going to sell it and buy something else you should put back that share of the gaming funds into the account to be put toward the next purchase so things like that also if you do get donations from those service clubs if their check on it says gaming then you should deposit those donations into the gaming account for tracking here and again this is all licensing so down at the bottom under section five this is the part that we're really looking at how did you spend the grant funds so in this example they've paid by check they've listed every date every check number who the payee is and what the purpose was as well as the amount if you're doing EFTs you can provide your general ledger to back that up to make sure it still has that information that we know who the payment was made to and what the purpose is, the amount and the date. And then the final two pages are really, the last one here is just signing off, having two board members sign off on it. This is your closing balance. So if you filled in all the boxes that are applicable, you go through with a calculator and it's simple arithmetic. Compare that number to your actual bank balance. So this section here is just to put in your banking information if there's a difference there then do a reconciliation what what happened why are they different maybe you you wrote a check and it hasn't cleared yet um, so you can include that information here um, or it might just show you that you've done your arithmetic wrong and you can fix that up before sending it in so it's pretty simple we do have example forms and a tutorial on our website we're more than happy to walk you through it um, but it is something that anyone can do you can do for a previous board if they haven't got theirs in you can do it with your bank statements 
getting close on time here. I'm just going to go through really quickly an overview of the capital project grant. Again, this has not been announced yet for 2024 and the updated policy isn't out. So check back with us around May or June for specific details. Uh, so we do support capital projects with a cost between 20,000 up to 1.25 million. Our 20 to 50% of the share that we can cover uh, means that we can provide grants up to $250,000 maximum. Applicants do need to show that matching funds that are required to complete the project are secured when they apply. Um, and it's a competitive process. So you may come through with a really strong application and we see a lot of these that we're just not able to fund because someone else's was a little bit better than yours. The intake is usually early summer, like June to August, and then the notification will be out by the end of the calendar year. You can submit one of these per year and only one grant per project. You can still, you can apply for a capital project grant and your regular um, community gaming program grant as well. Uh, and then there's broken down into a few categories here. So it might be a facilities project. Uh, we're constructing a new facility, renovating, or doing um, large scale maintenance on an existing facility. Um, community infrastructure is public amenities, typically outdoor things we see like playgrounds, um, community spaces, skate parks, wharfs. Uh, we've even done an ecosystem restoration project and then acquisitions. So these are the purchase of fixed capital assets that will be owned by the organization for the long term to help them in delivering their programs. Things like vehicles, computer systems, um, specialized equipment, um, including sports equipment or office equipment, things like that. And then there is a competitive scoring process. This is the current one that's in the guidelines for 2023. Um, and we'll follow a scoring process like this, telling you what section of the application is worth what percentage of the overall score. So you know where to focus your resources the most. Um, broken down community benefit, inclusiveness and accessibility. Is the project feasible? and the financial considerations. Do you have the matching funds and do you have a strong budget? So check back with us later, closer to the summer for that. So I'm gonna wrap this up here, just share some resources with you. I'll leave the screen up for a couple of minutes. Um, you can, there's our website there for community gaming grants. We have a number of pages on that site uh, with all the information that you need. We have an email for general questions and we have a phone number. I'm glad to say we've got uh, a good host of some newer staff that was hired and trained throughout last year and they're back up picking up the phones again. Um, if you have something really specific to your organization or it's a complicated question, um, you can also email my team at cggoutreach at gov.bc.ca. And I do not want to forget to mention my lovely co-host, Kalina, uh, who's with the BC Association of Charitable Gaming, who represent charities and community groups like yourselves to promote access to gaming revenues. And they will assist you with applications. They can um, do presentations and one-on-ones as well. So I've got their website and the email there for questions. Um, under the BCACG, there's also branches all across the province that are there to help you, our community charitable gaming association. So if you want to see somebody who's a little bit closer to you, um, there's offices in Dawson Creek, Prince George, Chilliwack, Victoria, and of course, Vancouver. So there's the website there for all of those wonderful groups. So again, this will come out to you after the fact, so you can have these if, if you're not getting that written down quite quickly enough. 
I want to say thank you very much to everyone who's attended today um, and all the work that you're doing for the people in BC. We see it, we read your program descriptions, and we're all very moved. 